thank you for all of you that uh, came this morning. I, I'm sure that you are looking forward to the end of this torture, mine in the, in the school. Uh, so today I want to move into the um, uh, subject of uh, homogenization for uh, moving interfaces. But before that, I would like to finish with two things left over from the, from the evolution of France, the motion of France. And so one is to recall this definition I had last time because I did it very fast, the geometric definition for a moving front where I'm not going to write anything in math. Uh, uh, we want to say what it means for this set here to move with a certain velocity. So we go inside, uh, we go, uh, we find uh, and we claim that uh, that set moves with this velocity if it satisfies this inclusion principle, namely uh, if you start uh, the sa same motion, a little bit faster, and you move a smooth set in the interior, you stay inside. And so this, uh, and one can develop this in an axiomatic way, uh, figuring out uh, for what kind of velocities you can have this inclusion principle, but this looks to you a little bit as a maximum principle. It's the same proof as a maximum principle, because you let this thing go a little bit faster, and if you remember the proof, let's say, of uniqueness for the, for the heat equation, for example, of the maximum principle, that's what we do. We look at that function and we try to create a maximum. And so somehow here we do the same thing, but on the set level of the set. We let it move a little bit faster, and um, the first time that uh, if, they, if they intersect, the first time they intersect, there will be a problem. But you just need to run it for very little time uh, for, for which you have a... Um, um, a smooth solution. So it's a very flexible definition because if nothing else for the asymptotic problems we discussed, it reduces everything to justifying uh, expansions for uh, smooth uh, interfaces. So the second comment I, was, I wanted to make is about the role of the traveling wave. All proofs I did uh, uh, for uh, problems of that form started with uh, assume, uh, starting with the, with the traveling wave. So all the all the problems I had uh, eventually we were doing u epsilon x t equals q and let's simplify distance from the front over epsilon and the q was since we always assume that we have uh, wells of equal depth. Um, uh, satisfies that. That's what I mean by the traveling wave. So everything use that. Um, and um, when you do it in the pure cubic case or whatever, you see that uh, um, the speed doesn't really depend on the traveling wave here. The speed of the traveling wave is zero, so in the end you just get mean curvature and you don't see anything else. So the answer to that problem was mean curvature. Okay, that's what we got here. Then we notice that when we put an X here, we got mean curvature, I didn't do the complete calculation, plus uh, something that would have been ax dot n. Okay, that's what we got. I didn't do the computation, but if you remember, there was in the formal computation, there was a term that looked like uh, dy, and this was going to be q dot, an integral, so this will give you some normal. Okay. And finally, when we add it, that at the end, and again, I show you why it works, although I did not do the calculation, we got in the end anisotropic in curvature flow, meaning trace of some matrix that depends on the direction and uh, the gradient of the, and the principal curvature. And uh, I did not do the calculation, but this thing depends 
strongly on the underlying pulsating wave. So it's a natural question to ask, you know, is the, is the, uh, do we really need the traveling wave to do something? I, I wrote down the beginning of the proof. I never computed the state I am. Um, so do we need the traveling wave or we can do the proof without the traveling wave? And the answer is, so if I pose the question, do we need the traveling wave or not. All the proofs I know use the traveling wave. Uh, technically, you may, as I said the other day, you may think of it as playing a role to make the transition from being near minus one to near one. And that's where all the action takes place. Uh, but uh, you may argue that uh, I, I can do something without using the traveling wave. So, for example, um, let's take this problem. So I put here some smooth C oscillatory, and then I put 1 minus U epsilon square. And I put that there because if you look at the traveling wave that corresponds to, this is nothing else by hyperbolic tangent. So that's a nice function that makes a transition from one to minus one. And uh, you say, okay, I do that. It plays the role of this. And then from there on, I do the proof. But this will not work. Uh, in this case, please. And when I say it won't work, is that you are not able to control the error terms, and you would expect that that be the case because uh, you have this oscillatory term and there is no way to cancel it. So, for those of you who know a little bit about homogenization, you should think about the traveling wave as being a kind of corrector. And if you have it, as it is with pulsing periodic case, uh, it's fine. If you don't have it, there is a problem. Uh, which means that here is a big uh, open question. The same equation, x over epsilon, but now instead of periodic, I make it a random, stationary ergodic. So there is a huge uh, uh, literature about that on uh, homogenization in, in um, uh, random environments. Uh, I've done some work there, Felix and many others. Uh, qualitative, quantitative, the theory has advanced. Uh, and this is an open problem. And why is it an open problem? Because there are results by Zlatos that says that if you are in dimensions bigger than three, there are no, and I put it quotes, traveling waves, because there are some kind of traveling fronts, but no traveling waves. And I put it in quotes, because uh, the notion is, uh, um, so what he proves is there are not even generalizations, so the obvious generalization of the traveling wave which may look like approximate corrector for those who know what, uh, uh, what I mean. And the, the example is not, um, is not crazy and actually is uh, strange that uh, typically in, in all these problems that involve randomness, as you increase the dimension, things become simpler because you, the, the random thing has more room to move around. And so that is a little bit counterintuitive. So the question is, in that environment, what happens? If you have, if you have, uh, if you are uh, in, in uh, more than 3D or even in 2D, uh, how do you um, how do you homogenize? I, I don't know how to do that. I think that's one uh, very difficult and uh, open problem. And you may be prepared for uh, having some negative answers. So, for example, 
there is a work uh, by uh, Deer, Lookhouse, Dundell, is it? I don't remember, and someone else. Someone else that I'm not dismissing it because I, I don't know, uh, I, who looked at this problem. I shouldn't use F here, F of U. And that's random, and let's call it V. Whatever. Where G looks like um, um, has some certain structure, and they showed that for that problem, there are environments. So there is a randomness here, okay? There are, uh, uh, loosely speaking, the result says there exist environments. Uh, there exist environments for which If f is bigger than some f star, uh, there exist uh, stationary solutions. On u and omega. And this is a constant. So what they're proving is there exists an f star. And as I said, the result is a little bit um, um, I'm stating very loosely, they work with a particular, when I say there is an environment, I mean there is a class of Gs for which uh, there is a critical F star, and if you're above or below this F star, uh, there exists a stationary solution to the problem. Stationary, not in the sense of probability, time-independent solutions. When you have a result like that, that implies there is no homogenization. Because uh, since homogenization is long time behavior, long time, long space behavior, it means you're blocked. You may ask, what does this have to do with what I was doing there? All right? So if you think of the graph, so think of the original problem, uh, and there is an X, I think, here, as we will see in a minute. Let me put an X there just in case. Think of the, now the variables are getting stupid. W, W, W. So think of the original reaction diffusion equation we have. Uh, one or the other, I don't remember. It's the other way around. Yeah, you are right. If F is very large, it should move. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, so let's go to our original problem. Uh, if you look for a graph-like solution, the problem will be somehow. And if the graph is very small, uh, no, I'm talking about mean curvature motion now. So. Okay, sorry for that. Anyway, I, I want to do something else. So keep that in mind, that there may be obstructions homogenizing in random environments. And uh, in terms of the reaction diffusion equations that I discussed, this is an open problem. Um, I suggest for the students, if you want to work on this problem, uh, perhaps the best thing you do is forget how the rest of the stuff was done because it doesn't go through. You have to do something new, right? So don't, uh, several people have tried to take the proofs I show you and extend them, and they are dead on arrival. But uh, now that I described that, why, uh, okay, so uh, that's about the fronts. That's the, um, uh, another remark I want to make is about the two-phase BMO. The thing that uh, Felix was talking about. And show you the, um, uh, the um, viscosity proof to that. Or at least the key step in the proof. Um, so the scheme was you were uh, uh, solving the heat equation at time h uh, and some characteristic set 
and then the, you were taking, I, I, I do my threshold zero instead of a half. Okay, so in, in Felix's lecture, the, the threshold was a half. I will do it zero. Um, the half was there because uh, uh, it has to do with the fact how planes move. And uh, um, planes don't move if you go with mean curvature. So if you start the heat equation with a plane, the answer solution is a plane. And it depends on whether you normalize things to be 0, 1, or minus 1, 1. OK, so for me, the chi will be characteristic of some set minus characteristic of that. So you solve that for H. And then you make it, again, plus minus 1 by looking at the sign. And this is the algorithm. So chi at n plus 1 is the sign of uh, the S, S of H is the uh, S of H of chi is the solution of ut minus Laplacian u equals 0, u at t equals 0 equals chi. So now this connects a little bit with the, the way I described uh, at the beginning uh, all these motions, but saying that it's enough to look at functions which are plus minus 1. And I don't want to go through the actual proof, but I want to give you an, 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 um, um, the key idea of the proof, uh, because the actual proof will have to look at the limb soup of that and the limb inf, and then test it, and then test functions to use the viscosity definition to do it. But since I never did that, I want to show you the, the, the basic computation. And the basic computation has to do with the fact that um, if you are at that setting, uh, and let's say you are at a place at some xt uh, that, um, such that chi n plus 1 at xt is 1, you are at that point. This is going to be 1 minus 1. So let's say you are at the point that the limit is 1, and let's say the chi n, is, n plus 1 is 1. Then, uh, and we're going to assume also that chi n has an expansion. So we have a point x0, t0, has an expansion, a second order expansion. So all these things are assumptions. But they are not difficult to come down to that, because we will never work with a chi n. We will always look with something that touches the interface from above and below. So I will have here an inequality instead of equality, but I will have smooth functions. So if we assume that this has a second order expansion, at um, the point x0, t0 minus h. So I'm moving by h. Then uh, I write down the expansion. So I have 1, because I'm evaluated at the point 1. Uh, it will be equal to um, uh, uh, um, sh. And here I will do the expansion. I will put x, um, uh, x um, uh, I pulls out as a constant. Uh, the, um, OK, I write the expansion here. I put xn at uh, x0 t minus h plus the linear part plus the quadratic. So let me write that as a gradient of xn at x0, t0 minus h times x minus x0 plus uh, second derivative and since this is a formal computation I don't care about the next the next terms. Uh, you will look at that and say, well, this is crazy. I mean, if we knew the, smooth, the thing was smooth, we knew how to do the proof. But the whole idea of this course solution is reduces to the places where the chi is smooth. So you don't lose anything. But if I do that expansion here, for reasons I'm, I'm messing it up right now, uh, so this is a linear operator. You apply to that. S times this is 0, because this is a plane, and planes don't move. And uh, or a half, whatever. Now I messed it up. Uh, OK, uh, 0. This will cancel this, because it's a constant. It will come out and it will, uh, uh, yes. And then the only thing you have to do is to go 
to compute the heat equation, the solution to the heat equation to d square x n, this is minus h, x zero t minus h of this quadratic form here, uh, dividing by one over square root of h. So what you are doing is you are, you are, uh, you are having a, um, uh, you are applying the heat equation to a quadratic and you try to find the relationship you, the, uh, you get. And that's where the answer comes. So that's the calculation. All right, so that's uh, an aside comment to, to get rid of this. And now I'll go into homogenization. So I assume that uh, there's no time to give you a whole lecture on homogenization. Uh, homogenization, um, the way I like, I, I looked once at Wikipedia to give a popular definition of homogenization, and uh, it's hard to find one, but so I decided to write my own definition, which is, uh, is the process of making a soup. Uh, you take a lot of ingredients, you throw them all in, you stir them very hard, and you get something. And um, when you do this something, you don't know really where it came from. You cannot undo it, but you make any other thing um, look the same. The second definition that I had of homogenization, this was something that happened in my life. I remember with my, when we were enrolling uh, the kids in school, uh, in a Montessori school, someone asked the, uh, the um, director of the school, what kind of um, holidays do you celebrate? And now that in the US is, uh, is not Italy or, or Greece. I mean, there are uh, an uncountable number of religions. And, uh, and so the, um, the director of the school said, well, in order not to offend anybody, we only celebrate uh, Valentine's Day and Thanksgiving. And, and um, <sighs> well, let's say, the, uh, so that is another example of homogenization. You homogenize all religions and you come down to Valentine's Day. So uh, that's uh, a non-mathematical definition, but the way it usually is described as the following. You have a problem, this is like an equation now, that depends on many variables and uh, on uh, some scale. Uh, so two ways to think of homogenization. How does the epsilon A come? Either you have something very inhomogeneous and you look very close to that with the, with the microscope and you make a magnifying lens and try to see what happens, or you have something here of order one and you keep going further and further away and you try to see the average picture. Right, so if you could, uh, if you know that there is a road that is very uh, windy, but, but if you had the opportunity to go in space, which I haven't, I bet that if you see it from there, you, you're not going to see the minute up and downs, uh, right, left. So the way you describe that mathematically is you introduce a scale which measures either how far you go or at the micro scale where you are, and you come up with a problem of the form f epsilon u epsilon equals zero, where this is the solution of your model, f epsilon is some equation. And then the claim, of course, you would like to let epsilon go to zero because that's where all the, all the action takes. That's how you go far away or you're looking extremely close. And um, uh, the theory would like to say that there exists another equation f bar so the theory says there exists an F bar. You don't look at the solution, it says there exists an F bar such that if you solve F bar of U bar equals zero, then U epsilon converges in some sense to U bar. That's the theory. In a nutshell, that's what homogenization does. And then once you have the, the limit, and I will call that the qualitative theory, Then, of course, you are interested in, in, uh, in figuring out um, properties of the F bar because that's the key thing. That's the homogenized uh, operator and, um, uh, and also a rate of convergence for that. And then you go into the quantitative theory. And a lot of times, um, this method and that method 
don't necessarily go together. You have to develop different tools. Okay, uh, so let's go now to fronts. And I'm going to consider two kinds of fronts. Actually, one kind of front. That, uh, so I want to look at uh, fronts which are V equals um, some delta trace of, uh, uh, I could put here delta theta of, of n uh, and x, dn minus a of the direction and x. And the PD version of that is something to be delta uh, trace of, uh, um, so let, let's make that one now. So it's already complicated. Okay. And uh, you want to see if you have some anisotropy here, some, and then you want to see uh, what is the behavior for a long time, short, uh, a long time, uh, large space. Which leads to the scaling, the, the hyperbolic scaling, x over epsilon, t over epsilon. So you define the function u epsilon xt equals u x over epsilon t over epsilon. And at the level of the, um, of the PDE, that gives rise to the following homogenization problem. So that's the equation we have. And we want to see what happens as epsilon goes to zero. And the claim will be at that level, on the level of the velocity, or if you know, at that level there exists some uh, h bar of p, which is positively homogeneous of degree one, and therefore can be used Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. No, 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 no. It means curvature flow is uh, always for me a uh, trace of identity minus. Uh, I don't look at the graph. I look at the whole thing. I don't look at graphs. Uh, this is the gradient. No, the mean temperature doesn't, it's not applied. No, this is, uh, I have done the scaling I need. It's the second derivative. So, okay. Mean curvature flow of U is trace identity Ah, sorry. No, 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 I understand. Uh, thank you. The delta is there because I want to write the uh, results for both cases, whether there is curvature or not. So it's, for me, it's a, it's a bookkeeping. So don't, there is nothing magic on the delta. The delta will be either zero or one in what I'm doing. I just want to say what happens. And uh, now you are asking the question. So there exists an H bar. That's a parenthesis here. There exists an H bar like that. Once it's homogeneous, it means it can define a velocity such that u epsilon converges to u bar, and u bar solves that equation. And that's the homogenized equation now, and that's the homogenized velocity. Uh, I'm sorry for being more disorganized than usual uh, today. But there was one more thing I wanted to talk to you about front propagation before I go to that, and, I, and, uh, and which has, has to do with the following thing. Uh, I write a bunch of things, and I want to connect it with Brownian motion, the thing I said the first day. 
If I look at that reaction diffusion equation, I'll make things very simple, uh, the original one with F cubic, then we learned that this gives you mean curvature flow. If I look at that problem, so in other words, if I have my potential and I'm just disturbing the, 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 the wells by order epsilon, because that's what does, this does, then the claim is we had mean curvature flow plus a universal constant times C. Alpha is some uh, universal, con I mean, universal for the model. Doesn't, uh, alpha is independent of C. I didn't prove this, but it actually I, it's included in all these proofs I show you. So then you go a little bit further. Uh, okay, let's not rewrite it. And you realize that it doesn't matter if C is a function of time, because then you're going to get here a function of time. Okay? And if you put here a C epsilon, and the C epsilon converges to some C, and the C here is continuous, if C is nice, I'm sorry, then you're going to get, again, the same answer. And so now I'm asking the question, what happens if C epsilon converges to something, but the, the limit is just continuous? If there is any justice, since you're going to have a model with C epsilon there, the limit should be alpha plus CT. But if it, this is just continuous, because of the method of the proof, you have a problem. But let's continue along this line. So let's say, what if the C epsilon is some smooth, uh, if the C epsilon is a smooth approximation of white noise? B is a Brownian motion, dB is a white noise. So what you're going to get? Then you expect to get a flow that moves by mean curvature plus alpha dB. If you remember, that's something I mentioned the first day. And that's how you get that. OK? And as a matter of fact, I think I mentioned that the first day, an, an open question was, what happens if from the beginning you put Brownian motion here? What can you do? And the, the result there is that it will not work. This is too violent to do the job, but if you put some nice approximation, you can pass the limit. So that's how you get this problem that I mentioned the first day. Okay, so now I go back to my fronts. And I want to give you a bunch of results here. Where am I? Here, about this homogenization. So, unfortunately, to do it, I will have to use facts that uh, you either, at this point, either know or you don't know, because there's no way to, to uh, give you theorems. So, so after you do that, so this was this scaling, the long time behavior, large space, and then I want to do the quadratic, but let's stick with that for now. So let's start with some um, um, negative results. So the first one, so the negative results, I start with delta zero. And for starters, so I will start with uh, uh, x over epsilon periodic. And I want to discuss some examples at the case of delta is zero. And in which case, it will mean that I have a front that moves with normal velocity a and x over epsilon, or if you like, I'm trying to homogenize this equation. So I have messed up the signs. My signs change from line to line, but and we like that. If you follow what I'm doing, the sign is not going to be an issue. I don't think this is going to disturb you. 
Okay, so let me start with that. So what happens at the limit here? If A is strictly positive or negative, so if A has a fixed sign, positive or negative, then there is homogenization. So things average out well, and when I say there is homogenization, I mean there is a limit like that. So things work out well, and, uh, uh, and that will work for A periodic, and, uh, almost, peri and uh, almost periodic. Okay, let's drop this, let's keep it periodic. So if A has a fixed sign, there is homogenization. So what happens if A, and what does it mean it has a fixed sign? It means that the front really goes out all the time because it has positive normal velocity, so it only goes out, and if it's negative, it comes back. Uh, so what happens if A changes sign? Uh, the answer now is more complicated. For those of you who know homogenization, is what happens uh, when you uh, uh, destroy the coercivity. How you do it? The thing will go, go or come back, and maybe doing that many times. So the answer is very illuminating. It's that sometimes you don't have homogenization, sometimes you have, and sometimes you have homogenization. It's like what the famous applied mathematician said recently in a conference. Uh, he was presenting some of his results, and he said, well, this theorem sometimes is true and sometimes is not. Uh, and uh, so along these lines, sometimes you homogenize, sometimes you don't homogenize. Now, it's clear what homogenization means, at least mathematically, at least to me. It means you start with a problem, you let epsilon go to zero, you get something new. Uh, uh, Non-homogenization, it's uh, not so clear. I mean, it means that this doesn't work, but it may not work at many places. So, uh, so the non-homogenization is, is uh, split then afterwards in two parts, uh, at least in the kind of theory I'm describing, that either the u epsilon as epsilon goes to zero along subsequences or whatever go to different limits, and therefore they cannot solve a homogenized equation, or there is what people call trapping. Trapping means if you put an epsilon there that the solution converges to the initial data, or if you think of this moving far out, that it gets stuck by something. That's the word trapping. So no homogenization is that, and let me give you some examples. So with particular examples. So I'll take this problem, which is made up because this is, I'm not going to claim has much to do with fronts, but let's say I start with this problem. And I want to homogenize this equation. I want to let epsilon go to zero. What do you think will happen? Okay. I'm not going to do to you what Felix said, to, to, to not, to work, not to move from there on, but I'm going to go to the other thing I, I, I always tell the students when I teach. When I stop and I ask a question, I, first of all, I expect that the answer to be simple. Like, let's say, I don't expect the answer to be 10 to the 16th over whatever. It will be something simple. And uh, it has to be something you can do, and it has to be related to what I just said. So I, I, I give you all the hints. So I want to see what happens to that as epsilon goes to zero. What do you think will happen? This is the x-axis. Formally, these are the points where the cosine is zero. When the cosine is zero, this doesn't move. But these points come closer and closer as epsilon goes to zero. So the solution converges to u zero as epsilon goes to zero. And that is what I will call trapping. Okay? Yeah, goes to, to that. Now let's take this example and make it a little bit more uh, front looking. So I will keep that. 
Um, so here I'm in R2. I have a function of uh, x, y, and t. And so I put the only variable, and uh, at 0, this thing is uh, y. So in other words, I have this plane. Uh, the space is uh, x, y. I have this plane, OK? And I let it move by this velocity. What do you think will happen? Now, that's, more, uh, that's harder. But think about it. I did the trapping. I told you where there is no homogenization, there will be the trapping, or the limits are not going to be the same. So it will be a sad situation. So uh, what happens here is you're going to have two solutions. This would be a maximal solution, which will be like y plus t. And this will be a minimal solution, which is y minus t. And all the limits will bounce around here. So here's an example of no homogenization. And the reason is that there are some points where you're going to be going up, and some points you will be going down. There's no limit. Yes? Any limit will satisfy something like, will oscillate. I'm not saying that any function like that will be, but it will oscillate between these two. I, uh, no, because the actual theorem is that the limb soup of epsilon, in the way I define the limb soup, of x t is of x, y t is y plus t, and the limit is u epsilon of x y t equals y minus t. There is no limit. No. And um, now, you may say, look, what is failing here is the fact that this thing starts oscillating so widely so that um, uh, you cannot control. So somehow that you may claim this has to do with the fact that there are no Lipschitz bounds, that the u epsilons are not uniformly Lipschitz, so they will go like crazy. So that's an example of no homogenization. Um, let me give you another example where both things can happen. So I have an array of uh, balls like that. And in each ball, I have a A, which is negative here. It goes from 1 down to 0. And uh, this, again, is a circle, and it's 1 here. So I have this array. and, and uh, of balls where, uh, and I'm looking always at this problem with such an A. And this is an infinite array. So let's start with a plane here and start moving. Start moving. So I take this as an initial condition on the problem, and I start move. So the plane outside the balls, this has velocity 1. So it keeps going like a plane till it hits the balls. Now, let me give you a dramatic example of that. It's like having a, uh, suppose that uh, A's were not, uh, suppose you had some obstacles on, uh, uh, you're on the floor, and you put some obstacles, and you have, um, I mean, this is not what's happening here, but you take um, an elastic band, and you move it on, uh, on the plane, uh, no friction, whatever. You just move it. Uh, my friend there has, uh, has the other end, and we are moving, and everything goes smoothly. And then there are some obstacles. The moment I hit the obstacles, the thing will start bending. Because we are moving, and so when you hit there, it's going to slow down. Remember now, the picture has this extra. So once it comes in here, it will start slowing down. Because outside still goes with velocity 1, but inside it goes with velocity between 1 and 0. We keep going. Uh, the picture is qualitative, huh? uh, not quantitative. 
uh, and it hits the places at some point the place with h0 so we are in the case where the front comes like that and it's this way then what happens these points cannot move it gets stuck zero means it doesn't move the same way we said that whenever the cosine is zero it doesn't move but the other sides keep going it's pulling. So if this is an elastic band, what's going to happen? It's going to break at some point. Huh? Maybe we need to pull it all the way down there, but at some point it's going to break. However, if this were an electric signal that is going, and you are there and you want to see what comes from here, what you see is that instantaneously, after that moment, the thing reconstitutes itself as a plane and starts going. So in a heuristic way, you can say it leaves something behind, but the leftover again looks like a plane. And that was a very hot thing uh, uh, when, uh, I was trying to see, maybe even when uh, Sigurd and I were uh, a little bit younger, that had to do with uh, uh, Star Trek, I don't know how much Star Trek you watched, but if you watch Star Trek, there was this uh, clocking device that the Klingons had that could make their ship invisible. And uh, the think of the uh, Klingon ship, spaceship as being this thing here. If you are there, you never know it's here, because the only thing you see is the signal coming through. And uh, in more modern world, um, uh, that uh, thing can be a plane that flies very high and they don't want to, uh, one of the stealth planes. And, uh, and that's the phenomenon you see. Of course, the issue there for them is not to prove what I will write down. Uh, the issue there is to construct a material that has this behavior. Okay, so what is the mathematical result? The mathematical result is that uh, now I'm doing this thing scale because it's easier to put the epsilon that the u epsilons converge weakly to a linear combination of two things. And these two things will be, um, and, uh, and u bar is something that moves an h bar is the effective speed that corresponds to A plus, the positive part of A. And theta is the mass fraction of A zero, of A negative, I mean of uh, A negative. So, so, this is the case where both happens. No homogenization, uh, you have trapping or, uh, or uh, so this is like what I said, you leave something behind. How much you leave behind, a portion, how big a portion of how much negative you have. And then the rest of the stuff move. And uh, it, you can justify that uh, because it's a weak convergence. So I'm not calling about, uh, it's weak convergence in infinity weak star. Huh? And, uh, and, and that's a theorem. Okay. So now I want to describe the case. I want to, so every, I state on the periodic case, all these things, hold true in the random case, whatever means, whether that means, but one has to introduce an additional assumption that, um, uh, which is that the map P to A P over P Y P is convex. If you want to go random. And this example, you can do it, but then it has to have to have make an assumption because the important thing here is not the periodicity, is that in one direction there is some unbounded that you can go forever. 
And so in percolation, uh, what you do if you were random, uh, you have to assume that uh, like in percolation, that there is a component that goes all the way out. That there are no, anyway, so let's not, uh, I'm not going to have time to do that. So now I want to go, I want to reconstitute the delta. So now I take delta one and study the same question. Now this problem is uh, uh, not well understood and anything can uh, happen. So let me write down the, the PDE now. And for some reasons, and I don't remember, now the A becomes V. And I want to ask the same questions. Uh, do I have homogenization or not? And uh, there is no, the results start becoming now more um, complicated. Uh, in dimension one, yes, but the problem is fake there. Huh? But let me take it out. So what would you like to say? Let's forget the dimension. If V, let's first case the case that V doesn't change sign. Okay? That's the first case we're going to look. Because it looks very much like, um, after all, this is like the first case here where everything was nice and the only thing I put is I put, I put I multiply by epsilon mean can virtue flow. So that's the closest you can do. And uh, here the answer is um, weird. In 1D, the answer is yes. In 2D, the answer is yes. So uh, the 1D doesn't have even a reference because it's a computation that you write, do it and you see it. In 2D, it's a very nice result of, um, of uh, Caffarelli and Monod. And in 3D, uh, not 3D, I'm not going to go, in uh, greater equal 3, the answer is no in general. When you give a no, you always have to say in general, okay? There is no result that says it doesn't homogenize. And that is due to Caffarelli and Monod. And uh, a provisional yes. And yes, if you make an additional assumption, which is that the gradient of V is that the um, V has to be bigger uh, D minus one times, it's either one or two here. So you need to have this assumption. Which is so beautiful and that's due to um, uh, uh, against myself. Notice that in one D that uh, is satisfied, so, uh, and so there's this discrepancy. If you want homogenization, you need to assume that or stay in one or two D. I mean, this is satisfied in one D. So if you want it two D, you don't need to assume anything, just positivity, and that's a result of Caffari and Monod, but two D is very special because you work with curves in some sense, and many things happen when you work, uh, uh, the moving thing is a curve. Uh, the counterexample, when you see a counterexample, when I say no homogenization, uh, uh, I, would, I should have called trapping because um, what Caffarelli and Monod did is they constructed uh, um, uh, 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 an object that has, uh, uh, is a stationary solution of that problem without the epsilon. Take the epsilon, there is a stationary solution to that. And therefore, if you, uh, if you put it there and you start with the front that is behind it, if it starts moving, it will get stuck. Okay, uh, now comes this condition, and where does this condition come from? 
Uh, and that condition is very sharp. This thing is a necessary and sufficient to have Lipschitz bounds on u epsilon. Okay, let me write here. Star is necessary and sufficient to have Lipschitz bounds on u epsilon, which are independent of the supnorm. Of, uh, of that. Uh, to get ba Lipschitz bounds that depend on the supnorm of that is simple. To get bounds that are independent of the supnorm is uh, very important. And the reason you want that is because you will scale this problem all the time. So you want to get something that doesn't change as you're scaling it in space, uh, the solution. And indeed, it is an necessary and sufficient condition to do that. And under that condition, we are able to, uh, to do this in the, in, um, in the periodic case, uh, if you think of the random case, uh, I think one, under some conditions, you will see what you need to have in order to work. Two um, is not known uh, uh, in 2D, whether you need anything or not. And under this condition now, in all dimensions, uh, uh, Cardalegue and Armstrong, Armstrong and Cardalegue uh, proved homogenization in the random case. But they need the Lipschitz bound. It's critical in their proof to have the Lipschitz bound, so it's under that condition that it can be done. And you see, there's a gap in between. So now the next question, uh, as you see, I'm not stating, I'm not proving anything today. I'm just waving my hands. Um, Everything I'm doing is under that, uh, that scaling. Huh? So a question that is left open here is, for example, is this really necessary and sufficient for more than two dimensions? Uh, more than two dimensions, yeah, three and above. Or after all, what is the threshold between that and that. And if you think what's happening here, that was a little bit related to what I tried to write here, but it's not here anymore, about this result of Lookhouse and Deere, and, and, uh, uh, because uh, in their case, there is an obstacle, and things don't move. So in, the three, in, 2D, in 3D, there is an obstacle, uh, and, uh, and uh, the stationary solution uh, the results went the other way around. Uh, first we proved that, and then they found this. So we didn't know that there is this. Uh, um, OK. So now I want to th look a little bit at the case of what happens if V changes sign. I'm going to write down a very particular result for that. That looks very specific. And then I will tell you what this very specific condition means. I learned that from a very nice paper of, of Bar, what the condition meant from a very nice paper by Bar, Cesaroni, and Ovaga. But first I will write you the result. So we're going to go to D. Uh, the u epsilon will be again x, y, t. And we're going to look at the problem. So this is 2D, of course. But now I'm going to go here v, x over epsilon, d, u epsilon, equals 0. And I'm going to assume that v is Lipschitz. And these are all my assumptions. I mean, all my, uh, this is the problem I want to load, 2D. So when I write x over epsilon, this is, sees it only in one dimension. It sees only the x, doesn't see the y. 
Okay, when I write like that, there is no y dependence here. Okay, remember this is a uh, problem has x y, but there is only x here. And uh, let me introduce uh, a little bit more notation because it will be important. Let's call v prime the antiderivative of v. Let's call v then the, the mean of v will be v1 minus v0. I'm on periodic in the unit interval, periodic in one periodic. I will call v lower bar, sorry for all that, but you're going to see they come in. Mean of v, I will call that v bar the max of v, v lower bar the mean of capital V, v upper bar the mean, the max of capital V. And now I'm going to give you a bunch of results. And again, this is together with uh, Cardalegue and, and Lyons in that paper I mentioned. If the average of V is zero, and this is less than two, It's trapping. The proofs are technical and based on the fact that because we are in 2D, we can reduce the problem in 1D and, and, and uh, work there, and then you deal with ODs. So here we have traffic. We are in Italy, so my question is to you, till I finish stating the result, uh, what does this mean? in terms of, of the vector field V. There is an there interpretation uh, for that thing, which I didn't know, and I learned it later on. So second condition, let's write a specific example. If I take V of x to be theta sine 2 pi x, and I take theta bigger than 2 pi, and um, then there is, uh, then, um, there is no homogenization because we have two a maximal limit. Uh, 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 okay, I do that and I take uh, v and I take u epsilon at x zero t zero x zero y x y at zero to be y. So I'm exactly in this picture. Uh, I have a maximal and a minimal limit. It turns out that the vector field that has this, pro if you have this property that is contained in the following property, that if I have a function g, that uh, integral of gy dy exists delta such that this thing is delta less the perimeter of E in the unit cube for every E in cube. In the Q is the unit cube here. Turns out that this is the meaning of that condition. Okay, so no homogenization. And now, is there a positive result? And the answer is yes. So now if I take a non-zero uh, V and either two is less than uh, the mean So since this is since this is not zero, this has to be either um, uh, positive or negative, it's positive, you are asking this, of course this will be greater or equal, but you want this to be less than two. So this two floats around all the time, or the opposite. Uh, there is homogenization. And you have information, and there is information about the homogenized H bar. Okay, so there is homogenization here. 
Um, this is a very special model uh, because, uh, I mean, where do all these numbers come from? So let me tell you where is this coming from. The result, at least this and that, one and three, are in some vague sense equivalent to looking at the ODE y prime equals minus a one minus y square square root plus v and seek periodic solutions which, has, which stay strictly less than one. So as long as you can do that, you have homogenization. When it fails, you have trapping. And the conditions for us came, in, came up in trying to construct this, which has to do with the corrector. So in that case, the corrector is like that, so we had to do this. Uh, so I mentioned to you the result of Baal, Cesaroni, and, and um, um, okay. Now, a couple more results, and I will finish. Uh, this is a provisional result. Huh? Tells you some class of, one class of problems where you can homogenize. Not much is known in, the gray, in, this, in this generality. There is... Um, another type of result by Deer, by Karali, Deer, and Yip, where V can change sign and U, uh, the U epsilon is graph like. So, if for some reason, uh, notice also here to have homogenization, I mean, uh, okay, so if for some reason uh, somehow you are lucky and the U epsilon st starts graph and remains graph, if it starts like a graph and remains like a graph, which is a big if because this has to do with regularity, then there is homogenization. Notice that that condition doesn't appear there. Although the V, I mean, there is no condition like that, which of course forces the V to be. Uh, so how does this go? If the problem is graph-like, one of the speakers mentioned that, that once you have the graph PD, you are at the uniform elliptic. If you can get a Lipschitz bound, some kind of Lipschitz bound, the problem is uniform elliptic, and then you can gain regular. So if you have um, some bound, may not be very good bound, uh, the problem is uniform elliptic, therefore you can use elliptic regularity to improve the bound. So you need some bound to do it. And so uh, they were able to do this, and they managed to get uh, bounds under this assumption. And now the question is, when is this graph like? So it turns out that the solution is graph-like if V is very small. So if you have a very small normal velocity V, if you start a graph, you stay a graph. So the final result of uh, uh, Nicolas, uh, Karali, and, and, and uh, Yip is for uh, a graph-like initial data, and for very small v, there is homogenization. But what happens in general is completely open, and everything I'm saying here is periodic, nothing random. The random case is a little bit related to this problem I described earlier. Okay, so I have three minutes. And uh, to go to the other case, so which is the parabolic scaling. If I do that and I look at my general problem, I will get mean curvature flow u epsilon, and now I will get 1 over epsilon uh, 
And let's make life simple. Uh, nothing is really known about that. I put the nothing in quotes because there is something that is known, but to write it down, uh, I have to say other things. And uh, you're going to start throwing things at me if I go over time. Um, nothing is known. And, um, you know, I, uh, the, the, there has to be at the limit you would expect. I mean, formally, I can tell you what the answer is, but it will take me half the blackboard to write it. Um, and there are many issues. Uh, so you would expect that at the limit you will get anisotropic mean curvature flow. That is the answer you expect if you just write it down and say, I can do it. Um, the presence of 1 over epsilon requires to, you have to do, for those who know homogenization, you have to find two correctors. And the first corrector is like a minimal surface with velocity v. So the first corrector will amount to solving the problem minus mean curvature um, dv, let's say, at the level of dw, at the level of pd. Uh, I have to write it. It will amount to write trace. Uh, okay. uh, as I said, mean curvature flow of w plus a of y w plus p equals zero, it will amount to finding a periodic solution to this problem. Or if you were to write w bar as w plus p dot x, and if you were to write this thing, say geometrically what it means is you want to find a minimal surface because that will become one. No, uh, not a minimal surface, uh, how do you call that? Um, you want to have mean curve zero equals one. And you want this thing to stay bounded. And that's, in some sense, that was the, the in some sense, uh, this is what um, Caffarelli did with the Rave when they did the minimal surfaces. But they did it for divergence form equation. And uh, of course, they were doing it for um, uh, graphs and to this is what they have done, but now to translate this thing. Uh, and, and now to go to the next level, so this is a first step. This is like somehow to, to say that the problem doesn't have, in quotes, a ballistic behavior, that there is nothing that goes to hell. That, in other words, that the 1 over epsilon doesn't take over. Okay? And then you need to build a second auxiliary function. Uh, let's call it Z. But to construct that, which will solve uh, some problem, and to find the effective velocity, you have to do some kind of a Fredmold alternative for something, but I don't think this is the issue. The issue is that the, uh, the, this something, the equation for Z, will see derivatives of W. And there is no way in hell that you have enough regularity to write down these derivatives. Okay, because it's the second corrector, so it's an equation. It's like doing, an, in other words, I'm making an expansion like u bar plus epsilon w x over epsilon plus epsilon square z x over epsilon plus higher order terms, and I'm finding the w and the, and the z. And when I write down the equation for the, uh, the equation for the w will be this. This is the one that's going to kill the 1 over epsilon, and, and this is... Um, the second equation, but the second equation con includes, and conceptually is what I did for mean curvature, if you think. I mean, that's, this was my Q, this was my P, right, when I did the fronts. Okay, um, I, I don't want to confuse you uh, more, and um, 
almost nothing. I mean, the, the, I don't think there is a clear, clear analogy of the, I forget, there is someone in Italy who has perhaps done, but I'm not 100% sure, the analog of the um, uh, Caffarelli, um, um, uh, they don't have a result, I'm not sure, um, uh, in the random case. I mean, the, the fact there is, it's very easy through gamma convergence to pass to the limit and find a candidate for the solution. The difficulty is the regularity, okay? And so the result in the random case should be there is a solution to that problem which asymptotically tends to planes. Okay, uh, the, what Caffarelli did allow prove, not, uh, did not prove, I'm sorry. What Caffarelli did allow did not find the solution to that. They found the solution which is bounded. A, an almost solution which is bounded. So they b found the corrector that is, uh, when you subtract the linear part, is bounded. But they didn't find an ex uh, They found an ap approximate corrector that asymptotically stays in a slab. And to do the random case, you have to do something like that and then it becomes a mess because, well, okay, so that's uh, a little bit for the experts. Um, I think I told you, I'm sure I forget things, but uh, I told you everything that came to mind um, for this. Um, I mean, there are other problems, but I, I, I don't want to, to throw, I mean, that's enough. If you want to work on this, these are enough problems to, to keep you busy. So thank you very much for your attendance, all these five lectures. And if you ever need anything uh, uh, about this, uh, just drop me an email and uh, I will send you, I will try to answer to you. Okay? So thank you.